In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear faithful, besides being the feast of all saints today, uh, it, it is also the 50th anniversary of the Society of St. Pius X, our beloved sacerdotal priestly society that has given priests of tradition to the world for the last 50 years now. It's a beautiful thing. Our present superior general just turned 50 uh, years old a few days ago, and so he must have been a brand new person when the society was founded in uh, November the 1st, on November the 1st, 1970. Uh, so besides that, I'd like to study a little bit with you the life of the Archbishop, Archbishop Lefebvre, the founder of the Society of St. Pius X, to see how everything that was happening, happening in his life was somehow directed to this fulfillment, which is to give the world, give the church, I should say, give the church 50 more years of priests of tradition since the year 1970. So something that's very essential in the life of the Archbishop is that he is fundamentally a, a missionary. That's how his life begins as a priest. He followed his brother, who's a priest, to Africa to be a priest of the Holy Ghost Fathers. And uh, the reason he went into the mission field was because he was so convinced that Christ needs to get to souls. So just as we said last week in the Feast of Christ the King, our Lord is the King of our hearts. That means that he's not going to dominate us by power or by politics or by usurping someone's throne or something like that. He's going to dominate us by his mercy. You're dying on the cross for us, making that so available to us. And who are we? Who can we how can we possibly refuse all this mercy from our Lord Jesus Christ? So the Archbishop, when he was the young priest, ordained in 1929, uh, he went to Gabon first for 13 years. He was called back to Europe for two years in Mortain, uh, France, and then called back to, and then sent back to Africa, which is Dakar, from, uh, for another uh, 25 years at least, something like that, before he went back to Rome again. But the point is, when he went there to uh, Africa in the 1930s, if they sent five French priests to Africa as missionaries, usually two of them died. Two of them died. Uh, and that would be from diseases or too much heat or just things that the European body could not assimilate. Despite that, Archbishop Lefebvre, Father Lefebvre, went to Africa. Now, when the Archbishop had been in the seminary, which was the French seminary in Rome, he had learned about the rights of Christ the King and how our Lord has rights over all the souls and how... Our lives should be in conformity with the fact that he has um, an ownership over our life and a responsibility over our life in order to present it to his father someday in heaven. That's simply the rights of Christ the King. And the Archbishop always stayed with that principle. It's interesting, he went down to Africa to be a missionary. Many of his colleagues from the same French seminary in Rome returned to France to be priests and bishops, a lot of them, because those are, that's not an ordinary seminary, the French seminary in Rome. That's for the, the better ones, you know, the elite. And a lot of them became bishops. And the archbishop, he would um, go back to Europe occasionally, usually once a year, sometimes a little less often than that, he would go back to Rome and, and France, and he would see these priests and bishops continue, continuing in their career, and he saw how they were getting farther and farther away from this principle, that our Lord Jesus Christ has rights over our souls, and therefore he has rights over the society in which we live. And there kept being this greater and greater divide between the way he thought and the way they thought. And the reason the archbishop could stay <clears throat> with such a... Um, Fundamental principle is this, Christ has rights over our souls, Christ has rights over our society, is because he could see that in its pure sense in the mission work. You see, when you deal in the mission field, as he did, he was dealing with innocent souls, you give them a principle, 
and they stick with that principle. Whereas if you deal with souls who are not so innocent anymore, Europe had had already 1,900 some years of Christianity and a lot of um, indifference mixed in and some Protestantism and all kinds of things. Uh, you give them a principle and they start to mix it together with their modern politics and modern policies. And so he could see this divide growing greater and greater between what he was doing in Africa and what they were doing in Christian Europe. And he was grateful for his years of being a missionary because that's what kept him hanging on to the truth. He would say that. He would say that. At one time he went back to um, France uh, during some vacation and some bishop uh, kind of reprimanded him saying that um, you're too old-fashioned, you're too integri integrist, and the word that started coming out of that time was, you're too traditionalist, all used in their sort of derogatory sense, meaning you have to be more like us and more modern. And the, the, the bishop was saying, your problem is that you're always making the Catholic Church look like a wicked stepmother. <laughs> a wicked stepmother. That expression means that we insist on no salvation outside of the Catholic Church, you must receive the sacraments. You must live in the state of grace. And if you're not in the state of grace when you die, you're not going to heaven. All right. Them are principles. What are you going to do about it? Uh, he was always insisting on that. And his fellow bishops, or what used to be his colleagues from Rome, accused him of making a wick, wicked stepmother out of the church. The archbishop was not affected by that, but he knew he was going in the traditional direction, and they were not, and that was causing this divide. So um, he was so insistent on the missionary work, and you will see when the church became modernist, or finally caved into modernism, I should say it that way, when the church finally caved into modernism by the 1960s, uh, and it wasn't about original sin and sanctifying grace and sacraments and the sacrifice of the mass anymore. It was more like man is a wonderful thing. Jesus Christ came here to earth to tell man what a wonderful thing he is. And thanks to Jesus Christ coming, all of man is so elevated that even without baptism, he goes to heaven. You see, that's what Vatican II taught. Uh, Archbishop Lefebvre would say, Unfortunately, because of what Vatican II has taught about all this dignity of man, etc., there's no reason for the missions. There's no reason for missionaries. The purpose of a man going from France to Africa, knowing that he's risking his life, two men out of five died, uh, is because he's going at all costs to make sure that those souls get sanctifying grace by baptism and that they live in that grace by the rest of the sacraments and by catechism, etc. Because otherwise, they really, really, really risk not being able to go to heaven. There might be an ounce of opportunity, a sliver of opportunity they have of possibly getting to heaven without a missionary, but it's very likely that no. So there was all energy and all force just to get the missionaries there. That's his life. That wasn't just a little bit of a, you know, why don't you take this missionary tour of duty for a few years and then come back to Europe and see how you're doing? No, he went there because he was convinced he was going to be a missionary for his whole life. And he really ended up being so. Uh, he said, well, Vatican II has taken away the whole missionary spirit. There's no reason to risk your life anymore because they're all going to heaven already. So that was a um, huge blow. So Archbishop Lefebvre is essentially a missionary. We know him as the one who preserved tradition and preserved the priesthood, but he could not have done all that if he wasn't, first of all, a missionary, with that conviction that our Lord must get to all souls at any cost. So that brought the Archbishop from the year 1929 to the 19, year 1960. He was called upon to help prepare the uh, Second Vatican Council, which they worked on for two years. They made what's called the famous 200 preparatory schemata. Schemata would be different plans of the things that were to be spoken about at the Vatican, Vatican Council, such as um, 
priests and their breviary and how they should be praying it, such as the missionary orders and how they should be speaking to different souls. A lot of consideration also about um, religious orders and uh, also different plans that can keep people in touch with the church and with the holy sacrifice of the mass. All good uh, orthodox uh, things. And as you, you might know already, once the Second Vatican Council started, there were just a few votes upon this and a few votes upon that, and all the preparatory work was thrown in the dustbin. That's what the Archbishop says in many, many books. So he worked on all that. Uh, at the Vatican Council, he was the director of a group called the, uh, the Group of International Fathers. It was about 200 bishops that were all working in the dire direction of uh, maintaining tradition in the church. Whereas the uh, bishops on the other side, there are about 200 of them also, working in the direction of flying from tradition, getting away from tradition. And then 2,000 bishops in the middle saying, well, whichever way the most powerful group pulls, I'll go that direction. That summarizes uh, Vatican II. At the end of Vatican II, he was called upon to be the um, if, um, superior general of the largest missionary order in the world. The same one that he belonged to, which is the Holy Ghost Fathers. And they had 5,000 priests at that time. And he was their superior general. He moved their um, mother house from France to Rome. He did a lot of organizing for the missionary order so it could be more effective in the whole world. And then within about six years, that was supposed to be a 12-year term as being um, superior general, in about six years' time, he faced the same problem that many other superior generals of religious orders were facing. Uh, starting from the congregation of the um, religious orders in Rome, rules and orders were, be given, were being given, not just to the superior generals of the, missionary, of the religious orders, but to the different higher-ups of the religious orders to say, you need to have more spirit of democracy in your religious order, and everything that your superior general tells you should be considered by a democratic board. You know, in other words, he's not the first word anymore, and he's not the last word anymore. And religious order after religious order was kind of folding up because of this democratic spirit. And um, so the Holy Ghost Fathers were going to have a meeting about just this sort of thing, and the archbishop was on his way to the meeting uh, to be present for it with them as the superior general. And you may know about this, and you might have seen a photograph about this. Uh, the archbishop passed by uh, the um, place where uh, Padre Pio lived, um, um, San Giovanni Rotonda. And uh, the archbishop, talk, archbishop talked to Padre Pio and explained the situation. They wished to destroy our order by making a huge uh, spirit of democracy. And Pope, uh, Pope uh, uh, Padre Pio told him, I know all about it. Another religious order superior was just here complaining about the same nonsense. Uh, you can be sure of my prayers, and none of this should be going on right now. And uh, Padre Pio kissed the ring of Archbishop Lefebvre, and Archbishop Lefebvre went to the meeting with his religious order. As some uh, months later, the wicked people in the church said that, that what was happening at that occasion where they had this photograph was uh, Padre Pio was... <clears throat> scolding Archbishop Lefebvre for not being part of the spirit of Vatican II. This is pure lies, pure lies. But what I especially want to stress here on the second point, which is the dealing with Vatican II and the, and the Holy Ghost Fathers, etc., you see a transitional state in the life of the Archbishop going from being the founding missionary that he was, passing through a transition of the church in crisis, and then out the other side comes the Archbishop founding the Society of St. Pius X, which is what we celebrate today. Uh, he founded it, uh, if I were just a pure uh, man talking, I would say he founded it uh, against his will. But if we speak supernaturally, we'll say he founded it by pure providence. The Archbishop was 65 years old. He had already taken his two suitcases of all his belongings from the um, house of the, the superior of the um, 
Holy, uh, fathers of the Holy Ghost. Uh, he was on his way leaving, and he went back to um, France to retire and to spend the last 20 years of his life praying, studying, maybe giving conferences. But as far as being a bishop and someone with great influence on the church, that was over. That was finished. And sure enough, within, within a few months, came some seminarians to him saying, we still need your help. We're not getting a traditional formation anymore. You're known as the bishop who kept tradition going. We wish to do something with you. So he started giving them some classes, but he had them go to uh, a university that still taught religious uh, for their philosophy and theology. And then uh, as that university started getting more secular, even in the philosophy and theology classes, uh, he, started, he rented a home in Freiburg where he was able to give them more presence, uh, more, uh, more classes, more influence, more formation. And then uh, he was moved out of that because that religious superior was given, the one in charge of that house in Freiburg was given pressure not to house or not to give asylum to the archbishop and his work. So they had to move from that. And that's where they were, uh, some men from this place, which is now Icon, approached him and said, we have a house for you and we want only tradition to flourish there. That eventually became the famous uh, seminary and mother house at that time of Icon. Someone said to the archbishop, you should now see if Bishop Charrier, who is in charge of this area of Switzerland, will give you approval for everything that's happening here and will approve your um, pious society, of the Society of St. Pius X, uh, canonically. And he said, well, I suppose that's the next step, but I don't really expect any kind of positive result. And so he did present this, the statutes to Bishop Charrier, and uh, he said, have a look at that. Um, we, cannot, we cannot proceed any farther if we don't have any canonical approval. Now, the archbishop is a man of the church. Um, he knows everything about canon law. He knows everything about canon lawyers. He knows that in order to have a legitimate organization in the church, you have to be legitimately and canonically approved. Bishop Charrier, who is going to be retiring within, retiring within the space of one year, shortly wrote back to the archbishop and said, your pious union, the Society of St. Pius X, is completely approved with only the traditional mass and all of your traditional doctrine, everything. I have no question, I have no uh, criticism whatsoever. Thank you for handing me the statutes. You're welcome to come here now for your document of approval. So the Archbishop gained that approval by Bishop Charrier, and within one year that man retired, and it would, it would be years before any other bishop would show any kind of approval for Archbishop Lefebvre. So uh, what's the, uh, the story here? What's the, the, the moral here? Is that the Holy Ghost is still guiding the church. The Holy Ghost made sure that Archbishop Lefebvre did everything he did there because all of that was a step against his own proper desire. He wouldn't have taught more seminarians. He wouldn't have had them go to university. He wouldn't have uh, had the house in Freiburg. He wouldn't have had the house in Nikon. He wouldn't have asked for official approval of his statutes. It was time to go and study for the rest of his life. But all of this just kept coming and coming and coming from providence. So he himself, the archbishop said, all of this happened against my better judgment, but it was obvious that God was directing this thing. And so, like I say, here we are 50 years later, when the archbishop passed away in the year 1991, <clears throat> there were about 200 priests in the society. Now we're at... Uh, uh, we're at almost 600. And so since 1990, that work has tripled. And uh, he's the one that got it all going from 1970 to 1990. And it's a, it's a blessing by God. I remember when I was in the seminary, our uh, superior, our rector of the seminary said that, you know, you can, people can criticize the society as they like. Uh, but at the end of the day, they all have to admit that it is a legitimate foundation of the Catholic Church. When you study it humanly, it's as if the society just got under the wire, whew, 
so to speak, just sort of escaped, or how are we going to describe that, just got under the wire to be formed, found it officially, and then it, it proportionally, it has continued as the, um, percentage-wise, it has continued as the most growing religious order in the world since 1970. I know we don't have thousands and thousands like the Franciscans or the Dominicans or whichever religious order, but that's all going back to the Middle Ages. If you try to, ch try to check on those groups since 1970 and see if they've had the same proportional growth as they've had before, it's impossible. Whereas you study the society and it starts from five men and we're at uh, 600 in the space of 50 years, that's going pretty strong. And uh, that is the Holy Ghost continuing the work of the church. And it's happening through the society right now. Uh, I'm sure you know about the year 1976, where the archbishop was told that he had to close his seminary. He said, I'll be obedient as soon as you give me an, an official trial of the church. But since you've just treated me with a um, kind of um, uh, unfair, uh, unannounced visit, nothing canonical whatsoever, sorry, we're going to continue with the work of tradition. And he said, now that all the superiors of the church have given up on their work for the priesthood and saving tradition, I do not want to go to my particular judgment with God accusing me of participating in this revolution. For that reason, the seminary stays open because I do not want to be accused of being someone who helped to destroy the church. That was in 1976. Twelve years rolled by, and it was time for the archbishop to consecrate at least one bishop, if not four, which is what he finally did. Uh, and he was given an official visit by Rome, again, by Cardinal Gagnon of Canada. Cardinal Gagnon was present at the side of the archbishop on December the 8th, 1987, to receive the um, engagements of the seminarians of Icon. Now remember, Rome is supposed to, at that time, was supposed to be considering Icon and the Archbishop as suspended from all uh, sacramental action. And there is an official representative of the Vatican, a cardinal no less, at the side of the Archbishop, receiving the engagements of the seminarians on December the 8th, 1987. So either these men never took their suspension seriously or uh, they felt so much pressure to finally come around to the ways of the archbishop that they're finally giving into the tradition like he was. I don't know. You can explain it as you will. But that is a reality and that's a historical fact. As you know, it turned out by May of 1988, it was obvious to the archbishop that Rome had no efficacious desire to make sure that tradition would continue through more bishops. So he said, well, here we go again. I do not want to go between my judge saying that I participated in the destruction of the church. Therefore, four new bishops, and here they come. So, and that brings us to 2020. If it weren't for those actions of the archbishop, all of the work of tradition would be dead. I know the priest that gave us our mass when I was a little kid, because he uh, stayed with the traditional mass, uh, despite so many other priests that went with the Novus Ordo mass, he passed on to his judge in the year 1980, 1990, I think it was. You know, 30 years have gone past since then. Where would I be? You know, where would the rest of us be? We'd be without priests and without mass and uh, somehow integrated into this system where um, they're only getting mass once a month at the most, each person. It's because of the archbishop, obviously, working for the Holy Ghost, that all this was made possible. The Archbishop, um, and this will be my closing point, when he preserved the work of tradition, he didn't say, we're starting a seminary to preserve the work of tradition, we're only going to have the traditional Mass, and wherever we go, wherever we go we're going to preach tradition. Those are not his words. Uh, that might not have even been his goal as such. His words and his goal were, we are going to preserve the priesthood. We are going to sanctify the priesthood. 
meaning that by that time, the priesthood was losing all of its substance. The priest was no longer offering a mass which insisted on sacrifice, a mass which insisted on the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, and a mass which insisted on the priesthood itself. By that time, 1969, the mass had turned into sort of a democratic function where the priest was a presider, no emphasis on sacrifice, only emphasis on love of neighbor, and um, the, the people, the faithful, were given the idea that somehow their presence at Mass was making Christ present just like the priest's presence at Mass. So Archbishop, Archbishop Feb said, no, this has got to stop. We have to go back to sanctifying the priest and everything that's involved with sanctifying a priest, which means he has to have the true sacrifice of the Mass, which means that the faithful have to follow the priest in the sacrifice, but they are the, not the main sacrificers. And which means also that in the Mass, in the Church, there has to be the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ in His body, blood, soul, and divinity. If you take that away, our Mass goes insipid or our Mass goes without substance. And as you know, if you visit any other church besides ours, you will find the Blessed Sacrament uh, put to the side or put behind Somehow it's not the main attraction anymore. Whereas when you come into this church, you know that we get silent in this church and everybody has to give our Lord a sign of reverence, which is usually the genuflection for those who can do it, before they can get into their pew. So it's a silence which screams reverence at you when you come into the church. And it's the presence of our Lord in his sacrifice which demands this kind of respect. The Archbishop said, Archbishop said, we have to get back to that. The sanctifying of the priest, that's what we've lost. So if we were to condense into a word what the Archbishop was about and what the Archbishop preserved, it would be that, the sanctification of a priest. That started with his years as a missionary, that persevered in his years, those transition years where he stuck up for the truth even though all the churchmen went against him. And finally it came to fruition when he was able to find, found the Society of St. Pius X with a few seminarians and then all the work just kept blossoming and blossoming by the work of the Holy Ghost, which was even against his way of doing things, uh, the Archbishop's way of doing things. To sanctify the priesthood, that's what it was all about. And thanks to the Holy Ghost working through the Archbishop, we're still here. Thanks be to the Holy Ghost. Thanks be to Our Lady and the Saints for making this all possible. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.